Welcome to Adventures in Whoville, uh, the proposed gaming disorder's impact on games for change. Quick show of hands, how many people have been following what's been going on lately with the gaming disorder? Okay, so that's going to be fun. <laughs> Um, so just to start off, just to tell you a little bit about me, I am a Vice President of Serious Games and Strategic Partnerships at Breakaway Games. Um, I also am the Director of the Serious Games Showcase and Challenge. It's a nonprofit competition for learning and educational games. Um, and I'm a mom to that little spunky thing right there. So normally when I share my background, I tell you all about my academic experience, I tell you all about the work I've been doing for years, and I use that to establish myself as an expert on the topic I'm about to present to you. Um, today I can't really do that because I am not an expert on gaming disorder or any sort of claims about games, um, but rather what's been happening to me is as this topic has been gaining more and more media attention, it's been impacting me. Um, and it's been impacting me in my personal life, which was really strange, because although I make games, no one ever really talks to me that much about it in my personal life, but also professionally. So I was you know, at a girls' night out the other night, and my girlfriend said, oh, I just sent this article to my son about gaming addiction because I think he needs to be careful. I was like, oh gosh. So you know, I spent half my girls' night out talking about why I didn't think her son had anything to worry about. Um, and then my daughter, after a long hot day at Bush Gardens, we were out at dinner. My husband and I took longer to eat than she did. I threw the laptop at her, as all great parents do. And she was playing the award-winning game of Dragon Box Numbers. It won an award here last year. I'm not making that up. Um, and a random stranger came up and actually kind of got confrontational with me, asking me how I could possibly let her play that. And aren't I worried that she's going to get addicted? So my five-year-old is playing a math game, and this complete stranger is worried that you know, she might become addicted. But more seriously, as a professional serious game designer and developer, we just lost two potential clients who were pretty far down the business development path, interested in embedding games into some of their major programs. One was an anti-bullying program that was going to be a mix of different types of applications. And they've just basically said, you know, we're going to pass it this time because we don't want to be wrapped up in this controversy. We want to see how it shakes out. Um, and really, that was what caused me to reach out to my game developer friends, to the experts in the field, and just sort of say, are you having similar experiences? And I said, you know what, this is really something we should talk about at this year's Games for Change. Um, so I pulled together some of the smartest people I know to come do that today. Um, just as quick background, from that survey of hands, I think everybody knows who the World Health Organization is and understands what the International Classification of Diseases is, but they're focused on supporting internationally health within the United Nations system, and those ICD codes are used by medical practitioners worldwide to diagnose conditions. Researchers use those codes to categorize conditions, and foundations and governments they decide where they're going to drive investments um, and where they're going to develop public health strategies, often based upon what types of things are classified in the ICD. So it can have some pretty broad um, impact. Um, straight from the World Health Organization's website for the ICD-11 proposed draft, this is their definition of gaming disorder. And I'm just going to leave it there for a moment for you all to look at. Um, I don't want to open it up to a discussion of their definition at this time. I think we'll talk a little bit about it as we get through talking um, with the panel. But you can see some elements here, right? We're talking about a pattern of persistent or recurrent gaming behavior. They are focused on digital gaming. Um, it could be online or offline. It'll cause impaired control over gaming, increased priority being given to gaming, continuation or escalation of gaming despite negative consequences. And then they follow it with the sort of description of having behavior patterns that are sufficient in severity to result in impairment in personal, family, social, educational, occupational, or other important areas of functioning. Um, they sort of specify that this should be evident over a period of at least 12 months, um, but that that could be shortened if all the other diagnostic requirements are met. So this is you know, the World Health Organization's definition here. But really what the people who I've been talking to are responding to isn't even, I think, what the World Health Organization has to say, but rather the sort of media hype around this. 
Um, I don't know if you've managed to avoid it, but we certainly haven't. So these are a bunch of, you know, everyone from CNN to BBC to Rolling Stone to Forbes to every local um, newspaper outlet has been running articles with somewhat sensational headlines. And I think it definitely qualifies as sort of this media hype cycle where there are people, you know, speaking for it, against it, talking around the topics, and it's really causing this sort of social amplification of risk that can happen where, um, you know, although most estimates really say that there is probably a small percentage of players between maybe 0.6 and 3% that display behaviors that look anything like this disorder, there's sort of this moral panic that it's, you know, everybody who's playing gaming <laughs> is, is now impacted. You know, evidence, my friend who's now desperately concerned about her son, who is, you know, excelling with a 4.0 in college, doing just fine. Um, so that type of reaction. So um, as I said, I went out and started talking to people. So I called some of my game developer friends. I called some of my academic friends. I called some of my psychologist friends my mental health practitioner friends, and I sort of said, what do you guys think about this, and would you like to join me to talk about this at Games for Change? So here are my friends. Um, I've got Kelly Dunlap sitting closest to me. Uh, she's the mental health and games manager at iThrive Games. Uh, Lindsay Grace is there in the middle. He's director of the American University Game Lab and VP of the Higher Education Video Game Alliance. And then there on the end is Tori Van Voris, who's the founder and CEO of Second Avenue Learning. Um, and they're each going to bring a unique and different perspective to the conversation here on the panel. Um, the next thing I'm going to do is ask each of them to just take a very brief couple minutes to introduce themselves so you know the perspective they bring. Kelly? All right, so yeah, thank you for the introduction. <laughs> my name is Dr. Kelly Dunlap. Uh, I work for iThrive Games. And my background is I have a doctorate in clinical psychology, and I also have a master's in game design. And all of my research that I have done has focused on the intersection of mental health and games, from my undergraduate research to my doctoral dissertation and, and henceforth. So this area is something that I'm very, very passionate about. Uh, and then, so as a researcher, I have been looking into mental health and games for over 10 years. So I'm very familiar with the space and the claims that are made around mental health and games. As a psychologist, although I am not currently practicing, I have worked with individuals using games in therapy as well as with individuals who have been either referred to or self-identify as having some kind of gaming disorder or addiction. One thing that I do want to be clear about is my research is not necessarily um, empirical, so I am not out there doing research on game addiction, but rather my research focuses on the people that do and looking at their arguments and checking their stats and looking at their methodologies and then kind of corralling all of that information to inform uh, my perspective. Great. Thank you. And Lindsay. Great. Oh, thanks. Uh, yeah, so I'm Lindsay Grace, Director of American University's Game Lab and Studio, soon to be night chair at the University of Miami. Uh, and Vice President of the Higher Education Video Games Alliance. Woo! <laughs> uh, I've been uh, making games since I was a child. That's me. Next, please. Uh, and I've been teaching games and interactive media for more than 12 years, uh, including directing some top programs. We run a game studio uh, that I've been a part of since uh, we founded the American University Game Lab, and these are the kinds of clients that uh, we do serious games work for. We wouldn't call it serious games work. We'd call it persuasive play, but you get the idea. And I've been writing about games for the last decade, uh, 50 plus articles. And I've designed and developed scores of independent games on my own, most of them with a pro-social bent. I've also won some awards and recognition for that game design. And I am the vice president of a wonderful organization, the Higher Education Video Games Alliance, whose mission, next slide please, mm -hmm. includes <laughs> creating a platform for higher education leaders to have kinds of discussions like this. Great. My research focus has been persuasive play, uh, particularly if you don't know what persuasive play is, it's games designed to change people's interests, activities, or opinions. And uh, there's a whole bunch of us in this field, including um, some Games for Change regulars like Ian Bogost and Mary Flanagan. This was a, a conference we had in Amsterdam not too long ago. And I also write fairly frequently about um, the intersection of games and society and the ways that games actually show some of our values. So you can catch some of those articles in your favorite venues. I think that's it. Excellent, thank, thank you. you. And Tori. Hi, I'm Tori Van Voris. I'm the founder and CEO of Second Avenue Learning, and we develop serious games for the K-16 space. Um, 
I'm not going to read all of these slides yeah. that give, <laughs> give you sort of the background. My perspective for this panel today is going to be as somebody who developed serious games and sort of the barriers that we're seeing to adoption as a result of this negative media storm. We can keep going. Um, we were founded in 2006. We have had literally millions of playthroughs at this point. We win lots of awards, and we have a great time building serious games. Uh, and these are just a few of the things that we look at when we're looking to build a serious game, and we design for engagement. And engagement is a topic that we're all going to come back to because it ties to immersion. Um, and we're also looking at building a healthier sense of self and also looking at content and mastery. Um, and then these, I'm trying to figure out which one. Okay, so, and these are some of the criteria that we look at when we're building um, serious games or learning games. And our motivation for creating games is sometimes very different from that of uh, people who create entertainment games. And this is going to also affect how we think about um, the design properties of a game and uh, how it can be evaluated uh, in the marketplace. But we're starting to see schools being reluctant to adopt serious games because of this negative cycle um, in the media around the impact of games. And this is um, some of the research from one of our games, and it's how we measure whether or not our games have been effective. So are kids getting a better sense of self? Are we improving their sense of, um, in one of these, using Mary Flanagan's uh, uh, inventory, their STEM affiliation and their sense of self-identity? Are they replaying and learning and getting deeply immersed? Are we producing better um, learning outcomes? So these are the kinds of questions that as serious game developers we ask, which is very different from the, um, the, the motivation for creating an entertainment game. And so as people who need to be defenders of the efficacy of serious games, we need to also look at the motivations for creation. Okay. Thank you. Um, so I'm just going to talk for a quick second here about how we are going to organize the panel. And um, that's really all the prepared material we have for you today. I have a series of questions just to get this conversation started. Um, that I will ask of the panel. We do invite you to speak up if you have additional comments that you'd like to make or questions you'd like to add. Um, and then once I'm through the prepared questions, we will completely open the floor as well. Um, but I just want to ask you to remember that each member of this panel was selected to discuss how he or she has been affected by the proposed classification by the World Health Organ Organization of Gaming Disorder. And they're here today to help guide us through what the researchers are saying, to start a discussion about the impacts of this on our community, and hopefully to even extend that discussion on to how our community can affect that conversation. Um, and we welcome all of you to do that with us as we move forward. Um, all of the panelists have been asked to speak about this in different media outlets as well. So these are just a couple grabs from some recent conversations we've been engaged in. Um, so I'm going to get it started and just ask, what is the current status of ICD-11 and gaming disorder? Because there seems to be a lot of confusion about it. All right, so the ICD-11 um, recently finalized its draft. So uh, it is not, uh, gaming disorder is not a thing as of yet. The next steps for the ICD-11 is to go in, I think it is May of next year, mm -hmm. and it has to be ratified by the WHO. So they basically they have to approve it. If they approve it, it then goes to an, into effect in January of 2022. So you will not see somebody actually diagnosed with the disorder of gaming disorder until 2022, although I don't think the media headlines would have you uh, believing that right now. And if I recall correctly, it also is up to each state or each um, nation to decide whether or not they're going to adopt it as well. Yeah. So there's still a lot to go. <laughs> So the DSM, the fifth edition, when they were making it, they were thinking about internet gaming disorder, but that was an incredibly flawed uh, disorder and standard that they put out. But as far as I know, they're not looking at it again until the next, the DSM-6, which I don't even think is in production yet. Uh, the DSM-5 came out in 2013, so we've probably got a little bit longer to go. But internet gaming disorder is in the DSM-5 as an area that needs future research. So they identified this as an area that we want to know more about, but we can't include it because there's not enough research to substantiate it as an inclusion as a disorder. Yeah, but so is coffee. <laughs> <laughs> Caffeine disorder is in the DSM-5, along with gaming addiction disorder. So, you know, yes. Yeah. That's how serious it is. Okay. 
All right, so uh, speaking of controversial topics, what is the core controversy that we're seeing in clinical and research spaces about this disorder? So um, one of the things that I'm seeing uh, fairly often is that well, there isn't actually a um, clear definition for um, how we diagnose. There is no sort of, uh, for example, there is no, let, let me back up. So currently there are people claiming there is pathological game disorder. There are others who are saying that there is addiction. Uh, and the folks who have done this research, um, several of them actually come from the same line that we're investigating the relationship between aggression and games. Uh, and now what they've moved towards for one or two of those researchers is trying to come up with particular criteria, but none have proposed a, a solid criteria for coming up with game addiction, and several have actually explained that in some cases they're not sure that addiction isn't anything more, a game addiction is any, anything more than an expression of some other disorder. And clinically speaking, one of the big controversies I, I think that is out there is the, that there are researchers and psychologists who believe gaming disorder is a thing, and then there are those that don't. And that is a gross oversimplification of the clinical process. So all sides agree that you can play to an excessive extent. extent. You can have problematic gaming. It is possible the same way that you could have problematic dance, the same way you could have problematic eating, the same way you could have problematic sleeping. Like anything done to excess is not healthy. It's kind of inherent in the term excessive or too much. So the real debate here, at least on the clinical side, is there are some researchers who say there's not enough research to define gaming disorder as its own entity. The research just isn't there yet. We need more research so that we know what we're looking for. The other side is basically saying it's good enough where it is. There are people who are hurting, and if we have a disorder in place, one, it gives us a research target, and two, we can actually help the people who need help. And so that ultimately is the debate you're hearing between academics. It is important to underscore that both people for gaming disorder and those who are opposed to its inclusion in the ICD-11, they all agree that the criteria put forth by the WHO in the ICD-11 is too broad. So even people who support the disorder think that the criteria is not good enough as is. The other thing to note is that a lot of the research of the field um, suggests that uh, gaming disorder is a manifestation of an underlying condition, such as depression or OCD or other behavioral issues. And so teasing those two things apart is not something that I'm qualified to do as a designer, um, but it is certainly something that is part of the conversation and I think merits further study because I think if we're not treating depression or some of the other issues that tend to be comorbid with the manifestation of people who look like they're addicted to gaming, then we're doing them a disservice from a clinical mental health perspective. Yeah. And one other note in the, in the controversy space is the fact that if you can get enough people behind the concept of gaming disorder, then you can start requesting funds for explicitly addressing something that you created that needed to be addressed. But until it's, okay. it's clearly a disorder, it's much harder to make claims about the millions of dollars you need from NIH or whomever to, um, to do further research into this thing that you've created. Okay. So I'm actually going to pop up an infographic here um, Read between the lines. <laughs> that, that shares the average hours spent per day in leisure and sports activities by youngest and oldest populations. Um, and it lists there the Bureau of Labor Statistics, the American Time Use Survey here. So just take a moment to look at these numbers. Um, you know, we're here today talking about the use of games, which is almost all the way on the end of the infographic. Um, and you can see sort of the disparity between the amount of time people are spending watching TV, for example, um, compared with these other categories. Can I uh, jump in here? You sure can. So one of the things I think is important for people to see in this, because I, I try to talk about this in an editorial I posted this year, or I'm sorry, this week. Um, it, essentially, one of the things you have to note is, is less than 20 years ago, we were all very concerned about television addiction. And if you look at leisure time across the nations, including the US, you're looking at people spending between 200 to 270 minutes a day with television, but we're no longer investigating in media studies or psychology this notion of game addiction. So, or I'm sorry, of TV addiction. Um, so if you think about the, the movement of media, it's a good time to say, gee, have we been here before? What are we gonna do? 
Don't forget about pinball addiction. That was serious stuff. And the scariness of graphic novels. Um, one of the things to note is that there are actually a, a large number of studies that call out the negative impacts of excessive television watching, including depression and obesity and another number of other cluster diagnoses. Um, and those don't manifest themselves in kids who gain the same amount of time that people watch TV. So there's actually very different data to support um, healthy lifestyle um, impacts on the, on the two different activities. So with all of that background, why do we treat games differently from other media? The short answer is it's the new kid on the block, um, <laughs> which we're at the 15th Games for Change, so it doesn't feel like it's still the new kid. Um, but I do think that's one of the challenges. And the other challenge is that it's um, somewhat still a misunderstood medium. Um, it's often a separate, where something like a game, like a television is ubiquitous. Uh, you see televisions in lots of living rooms, but you don't necessarily see game consoles in those living rooms. Uh, and I think that's one of the reasons that people have such a hard time understanding it, because it's growing into its own. I would also say it's the, it's the literacy for the 21st century. And when we're looking to um, help schools adopt a serious game, we're asked a whole series of questions about the efficacy of the intervention. And you don't get efficacy of intervention questions about video libraries or textbooks. Um, there will be large scale studies on wholesale curriculums um, sponsored by the Department of Ed. But games are actually held to a very different standard um, by the institutions that are looking to adopt them. And they want that deep uh, research because it is new, it is disruptive, and it's a different way of engaging with students. Um, and so that, I think, is part and parcel of holding this new media to a very different standard. All right, and Kelly, I want to thank you because you did a great job of pointing out that we're not saying we're not concerned about people that may play games to excess, that people may have some issues with their play. It's really more discussing the current classification and how that impacts us. But I think as a community, we have a responsibility to accept both the positives and negatives that come along with gameplay. So I'd like to ask you to answer, how is it that we reconcile the efficacy both positively and negatively in games? What are your thoughts on that? One thing that I think is really important is, at least on the, the clinical and the research side, is everybody is trying to do right by the players. Mm -hmm. Everybody, nobody wants anybody to suffer. And right now, the, the division really comes from how can we best help people that are in need of help. And so I, I really don't even see it at that much as a division within the psych space, even though I think it is portrayed that way very, very often times. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's important to be mindful and aware of the potential negative side effects of things, but it's important not to just focus on that exclusively, because that, then that can become fear-mongering, and, and we don't want that. And we know that games can have positives as, as well as negatives. And as any piece of technology, it's, it's a tool, and it really depends on how you use it. So I think a lot of the reconciliation is going to come from having these conversations and these dialogues about how we're really not on opposite camps. It's not red versus blue. It's we all want the same thing. We just have different ideas about how to get there. I think one of the things that is a trigger for people to be concerned about games is the level of immersion that people observe in people who are playing games. And Chitset Mahai did a lot of great research about flow. And one of the things that we know uh, we have when we have a serious game that's really effective is when we can get students in that great state of flow where they're right on that sort of edge of continuous challenge and improvement. And we know we're being very effective then. Learning games tend to be time boxed and designed to have a discrete learning objective. So we'll keep them in that flow as long as we need them to to master whatever the content is or the skill is. But when people observe people playing in an entertainment game where they're fully immersed and they're actively engaged, almost to the point where they're not engaging with the people around them, that can feel very scary to people because it's not the way people engage with other forms of media, except for maybe people watching a sports game on a Sunday afternoon in their Barco lounger, <laughs> but maybe then they're screaming at a television too. So it's just something that I think that we know that games can be very good at creating immersion and that that flow is really important to our art of creating good learning games. But we have to be mindful of how that immersion is observed by somebody who is not necessarily a designer or a researcher and how that compares to the immersion that people observe when people are playing entertainment games. 
I think the other way we can reconcile the efficacy is to admit that we actually have a lot of unanswered questions. And I think both on, on the sort of positive and negative um, efficacy side, it's still a very young medium. And I think one of the challenges is that if we start labeling um, behaviors in the community too soon, we may actually prevent it from growing in healthy ways. So one of the struggles that I have, especially being a game developer myself, is figuring out how to actually talk to people about this. Um, obviously, if I spend my entire career and my passion dedicated to the use of games for change, the use of games for learning and education, I tend to sound very positive <laughs> in support of games. So what kind of recommendations can you make to us as a community for how to talk about this issue without sounding like a games lobbyist necessarily, without sounding, you know, to, to be balanced, but yet also figure out how to help people understand the full picture? My gut reaction is to just drop all the literature on their desk and walk away. <laughs> That's probably not very effective, but I'm like, this is what I did. Why don't you do it too? Um, because apparently there's some people that don't like reading academic journals. I don't really, I don't understand that personally. Um, but one thing that I like to do, I like to point out that everybody plays games. So like my grandmother, I called her a gamer once because we were playing words with friends. She's like, I'm not a gamer. I'm like, Grandma, you're playing a video game with me. You're a gamer. You play solitaire on your tablet all the time. Like, you are. if you don't like the term gamer, that's fine. But you are playing games. Everybody plays games. I don't think I've ever met anybody who has never played a game in their life, mm -hmm. whether it's a sport, whether it's checkers, whether it's your Sudoku. And if you're worried about how people are interacting with games, imagine what would happen if someone took your game away from you. And what I did for my grandmother is I, she was doing her crossword, and then I just yanked it away. And she got mad. And I'm like, well, <laughs> you don't like that very much, do you? You were, in your, you were in your flow state. You were doing your crossword puzzle. You were doing something you enjoy. And it was just ripped away from you. How do you think it feels? And I've done that with my um, therapy clients, too, when I saw them, as I did it to their parents. And uh, it got the point across. And so just, I guess, trying to humanize it. It's not this strange, scary thing. It's something that we all do. We all love games. And we've loved games since we were like standing on two legs. So humanizing, I think, is, is going to uh, do a lot to help with that. I think that um, one of the other things that's been very effective is helping people understand by analogy. So when explaining esports, giving them the sports analogy and helping them understand that there are teams and so forth, the same thing happens with the quote unquote gaming disorder. When we start to talk about populations, say sports players, for example, who might call off from work or do these other activities, they start to, they, people start to understand the grayness in um, such a diagnosis or such a claim. And then the other thing I often do is I try to help them understand that um, the, the challenge is they're concerned about should be diagnosed or um, at least reviewed from a foundation that asks questions about what's underlying this overuse of games. Um, is this person struggling with something? Have they been unemployed for a long time? The things that you'd basically be going to a, uh, a mental health professional about uh, and really sort of get at the heart of the problem. We've had this discussion over and over in, in games where it's easy to blame games for something that's happening elsewhere. Uh, so increased violence in society in the U.S. is easy to point at games, but we know that that's not necessarily the case. Access to guns might help that too. Uh, so there are a lot of things I think we need to be critical of. One of the things that I like to point out to people is that one of the most revered games was one of the first learning games, and that was depending on where you're from, Chester Moncala. Moncala is obviously much older. But we revere chess grandmasters, and we celebrate their success. And it is a game that takes hours and hours to master. And it, it was a game that we, desi we designed to teach leadership in warfare. So learning games have been around since the dawn of time. And so when you start to reframe games that maybe aren't digital, and make that accessible to people, it can bring down that level of apprehension about the role that games play in people's lives. A good analogy is actually um, explicitly that. It's looking at all the other games that we accept as games that aren't necessarily digital games and how much time we spend. So for example, the NCAA, they just did a review maybe last year, and the average college athlete spends 40 hours on athletics while they're in college. Uh, which is a pretty substantial amount of gaming, but we would never worry about that effort. And if you analogize that to something like eSports scholarships, the person who is a grandmaster at chess may actually be earning something from that work. I'd like to point out that 
you know, fans of football will go and out in freezing temperatures and strip off their clothes and paint their bodies. <laughs> and we think that's normal. <laughs> but <laughs> some of us. <laughs> some of us think that's normal and wear cheese on their heads. And, you know, we see that as just totally fine. Um, and spending 12 hours on a Sunday watching all of the NFL games is totally fine. But for some reason, if you're actively doing something like a game, a digital game, that is somehow just diametrically different. So what if I am concerned about problematic gaming? I mean, it sounds like you've actually encountered it in clinical practice. It, it could happen. Um, can I be concerned about that and still believe in the power of games? How do I handle that? I, I think absolutely. There's not a, you know, games are not inherently good or inherently bad. They just are. So I think you can be concerned. You know, I have a, I have a two-year-old son, and he loves his iPad, and he has learning games on there. And sometimes, even though I know all of the research, I worry. Like, have you had too much screen time today? And <laughs> anyway, so I, I think it's totally fine to be concerned. I think as humans, especially as parents, mm -hmm. being concerned about people we care about is a good thing. Mm -hmm. So when parents are concerned about their kids and their screen time and their gaming, I always try to talk to them like, that's a good thing. I'm glad you are concerned. If you were not concerned about your child, that's when I would become concerned yeah. um, and start to get other people concerned as well. So yes. There are games that can have very powerful, positive impacts. There are games that something you just do when you're on the toilet. Like it just, they, they can run the gamut. Um, and so it is totally okay to want to be informed, to want to protect the people you love, but also still be believe that games can have a powerful or positive impact. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let's talk a little bit about design practices. So what are the differences between designing for engagement and designing for addiction? Do you want to start? You can start. Um, well, I touched on this a little bit earlier, but when you're designing a learning game, you have discrete learning objectives that you're designing for, and very often those learning games need to be time boxed because they're going to be used in either a formal or an informal educational setting. So you need to look for a, a playthrough that might be 20 minutes or might occur over two or three hours of different sessions. And you have to design with that kind of intentionality. And you're looking for replay, but you're not looking for um, replay beyond uh, the needed number to get to mastery of what you want that person to take away from it. And so the game itself is designed to get you in, make you learn something, and get you out and onto your next learning task. So that in and of itself creates a difference in the way we design. The other um, thing is that you're <laughs> And then there was light. <laughs> You're just, you have to, the, the, the way learning game designers design is the business models are very different. We don't make more money when people play for longer periods of time. So our economic incentive is very different from that of maybe an entertainment game or one that's tied to micropayments that might take advantage of some of the behaviors um, that are more closely associated with um, gambling for money. Um, so when you're designing, you're looking to get flow, you're looking to have it time boxed, and you're looking for a different set of behaviors than you might be looking for in an entertainment game. Uh, I haven't met a designer yet who designs for addiction. I hope I never do. Um, but we do design for engagement often. And I think one of the strategies for engagement that makes a lot of sense is that we're essentially trying to give people an opportunity to, um, to, to wholly invest in something. But those experiences are often more rich when they are in comparison to the outside world, for example. So players who participate in both the outside world and a game appreciate the experience if it's engaging. Um, I think one of the, the, the odd, obvious problems with anyone who's designing for addiction is the fact that you're essentially looking to destroy your audience, which is probably not a good idea. <laughs> yeah, do we want to pause for a moment and talk a little bit about the word addiction? Um, or maybe not, as <laughs> so I see Kelly's face. But um, you know, it is, it's obviously a very colloquially used term. I mean, I've even been guilty at times of saying, I can't play that game because I know I'll be addicted. And I don't really mean I'll be addicted, I just mean I need more time you know, doing other things in my life. Um, it, do you want to discuss that? Did my eyes start twitching? <laughs> Um, so one, there is a problem that a lot of words that we talk about, mental health, tend to get co-opted into popular culture. Mm -hmm. So 
I will tell you right now, if you are adjusting the picture frame on your wall, please do not say I am so OCD. Please don't do that. <laughs> that's, not, that's not good. And if you're sad, that doesn't mean you're depressed. And if you're enjoying something, that doesn't mean you're addicted. So that's one of the issues is that we throw these terms around, even though they have clinical significance, um, we, don't, we don't treat them that way. And that's totally my psychologist bias coming in, so feel free to, to ignore it. Addiction, so um, the ICD-10 has gaming disorder is the title of it, and it is filed under uh, addictions not due to substances, or sometimes called behavioral addictions, which is a whole other panel of discussion that mm -hmm. I will refrain from getting into. But the idea of using the word addiction evokes a very specific schema. We think about people who are addicts. We tend to think about you know, people who are on really hard drugs and really at the bottom of their life experience. Um, you know, people who are drunk driving, people who are just like passed out in a gutter or whatever kind of trope you want to think about. So tying that kind of label to an activity like gaming that is for the vast, vast majority, over 99% of players, a completely normal and healthy habit is a little bit troubling for me. Uh, I also come from a psychological tradition that believes very strongly that addiction is something that happens when you put something into your body. So there is a chemical change in your body by putting a chemical in to your body. So the idea of behavioral addiction itself, I am less um, fond of, but I will totally opt to that being my, my training, my background. And there are plenty of very wonderful psychologists who would disagree with me on that, and that's, that's fine. So I think using the word addiction, one, it draws on existing fears, like parents are so worried that their kids are going to be addicted to screen time and addicted to TV and addicted to games that it's kind of fear mongering and it's lost a lot of its power in that, in the clinical sense of the word. I think we're good. Okay. <laughs> Um, I have one more prepared question, but I want to make sure we have time for questions or comments from the rest of you for the panel. Does anybody have anything they'd like to pose to the panel? Any comments they'd like to make? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I'm surprised nobody mentioned the, um, the potential China connection with the WHO mm -hmm. and why uh, the WHO chose to do this now and who the um, advocates for doing this are and what their ulterior motives are. Well, we can we can speak to that if you'd like. Yeah. Yeah. A healthy conversation about that before yes. talking in this room. <laughs> <laughs> do you want to start or do you want me to start? Go for it. Okay, so at, Jen and I were working on a, a paper and I spent a lot of time looking at um, a, a variety of factors including addiction and as I was doing a review of the lit, I was seeing an overwhelming number of papers coming out of Asia that were already accepting addiction as a foregone conclusion and their research was really focused on this, the scope and the magnitude of the addiction rather than whether or not it was actually a question. And there were, a lot of that research was very problematic. The, the study design was flawed, the cohorts were flawed, um, which is in part of being a flawed study design. But, <laughs> um, and so, and when we, when we got together, I started asking Kelly actually about that. I'm like, I'm seeing this really big divide in the literature, and there seems to be a concentration in some of the Asian countries where they're accepting this as a foregone conclusion, and they're looking to support the need for interventions. And now I'm going to hand it to you. <laughs> so... There was an open letter published by a lot of media scholars and psychologists that basically called attention to gaming disorder and kind of called it out. They received a plethora of responses, uh, about 10 different, I think 14 different articles responding to their concerns, 10 of which came out of studies conducted in Asian countries. And the consistent tie-in with all of these studies is the researchers were very concerned because of the gaming camps and the detox camps that are a part of the treatment culture in countries like China and uh, in South Korea. So if you haven't heard about these camps, they are not summer camps. They are uh, pretty much tantamount to child abuse and they more or less um, beat the gaming out of the children. And I mean that both literally and figuratively. So take that as you will. There's, and, it, and it's well documented too. Like if you, you can go and look it up and um, so that's an issue, and the idea is if we can medicalize gaming disorder, if we can make this, you know, 
preference for playing video games, if it is a, a medical condition, maybe, maybe parents and these societies will stop sending children to these kinds of really intense, inhumane camps. And so that is one of the arguments that is out there. One of the reasons there is push for it. And there's a very famous psychologist named Ferguson, um, Christopher Ferguson, who even wrote to one of the members on the WHO board who's overviewing ICD-11, and that person stated to him, now again, this is hearsay, so it's not, mm -hmm. it is still hearsay, but basically that they were receiving a lot of pressure from researchers in Asian countries to include gaming disorder in the ICD-11 because of these detox camps. I think that's a great segue to the, the final question that I have for you, which is how can we as a Games for Change community really foster exploratory research to support mental health, to address some of these concerns? Is that? <laughs> I, I just super quickly, I was just going to also emphasize a, a point I made earlier because it makes sense in this context, which is essentially you have to remember that some people will profit from the um, acceptance of game addiction as a um, disorder, uh, and there are for-profit camps as well that will explicitly love to have more people diagnosed with such so that they can gain profit from it. And that's even in, in the U.S. I know of a couple providers who list gaming disorder or game addiction as something that they treat. And yeah, probably. OK. So anything we can do to help? <laughs> <laughs> I think um, being supportive of fair and balanced research, sharing um, the balanced research in your communities, acknowledging um, fairly where games are being supportive of uh, people's overall health, and then as designers and participants in this field, holding yourselves to a standard that that enables us to move forward as an industry. So when you see things in industry that don't com comport with sort of best practices and good outcomes for the players, then it's incumbent upon you to speak up. I think we should be as critical of research as we are of the rise of games, asking lots of hot, tough questions and perpetually saying, well, will we, have we really done it? Do we really know yet? Yeah, I think that's a really great point. One of the things that concerns me is, I've, as I've been following these media reports, uh, media reports written by people that I respect in our very community have a lot of misinformation in them. And these people aren't intentionally sharing misinformation, but it's a really confusing landscape. There was a lot of research done in reaction re to the DSM, um, Internet Gaming Disorder, that you brought up previously. There were some studies that were actually refuted later. Um, and people are drawing back into the archives. They're pulling out old research. They're not looking at current research. They're not looking at, you know, they're looking at studies that had those flawed methodologies and not updating. So I think that we do also have a responsibility, um, as I wanted to say, to add our voices to the cause, but also to be really cautious about where we're getting our information, how we're disseminating that information, um, and, and really keep this dialogue going. I think to your earlier question, one of the ways to do this is if we continue to do the kind of work that we're doing here at Games for Change and the kind of work that people in this audience are doing, then we're also providing evidence of the benefits of games. So that it's not just, uh, well, there are all these problems with it. It's like, but look at all the great things it can do. And as long as we are as equally critical of all the good things it can do as we are of the bad things, I know I, that is always a struggle for me because I definitely have my own yeah. personal opinions, but you, know, and you try to be as unbiased as you can when you come to the research. So. You know, if there's a research study that kind of confirms what you already believe, be especially critical because you are vulnerable to just believing it carte blanche without having that critical eye if it's already something that you tend to believe with. So I can even give an example if you'd like. Well, we've got one minute. Okay, well, I'll do it really and fast. I saw a hand fly up, so oh, if so you want to ask something quickly, we please. could start. <laughs>
Yeah, thank you. That's a great point. Um, hopefully this has been enlightening for you. Hopefully that this has been an interesting conversation. Um, we'll all stick around for a couple of minutes to continue any one-on-one -on -one conversations. There's the contact information for everybody who was on the panel. And we thank you for taking some of your time to join us today.